open to Matthew chapter number 15. Matthew chapter number 15, uh, where we're going to begin our reading. Uh, Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, for sure. Um, like Brother Mike, I want to make sure I want to get that out there. If you're, if you're a mother, that applies to you, for sure. So, <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. And uh, so Matthew chapter number 15, uh, we're going to be reading, the t- I usually give the title of the message after the, the reading, uh, but this particular message is the persistent faith of a mother, the persistent faith of a mother. So if you're there and you're physically able, let's all stand out of honor and respect for the reading of God's word this morning. Matthew chapter 15, verse 21 through 28. <clears throat> it says, Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of the Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. The persistent faith of a mother. Yeah, let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Lord, we're thankful for godly mamas, godly mothers. Lord, I I thank you, dear God, for uh, the influences that you've placed in our lives, Father, and and Father, there's nothing quite like a mom. And Lord, I pray, dear God, that you just bless the moms this morning. And Father, and though we, though this is a special day, dear God, and Yes, Lord, we want to highlight the mothers here. But Father, though we want to do that, Lord, more importantly, we need to hear from you. And Lord, I pray, dear God, that your word would just be so real to us. And Lord, that we would see your word and hear your word and apply your word. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you would just meet with us and give us a great Sunday morning here. Lord, thank you for the special and Lord, just the the meaning behind that song. And Lord, I pray you just be with us now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> Earlier this month, my daughter turned seven years old. She turned seven years old, and I'll tell you, it flew by like, like that. It was first seven years, and then... Boy, in the next seven years, she'll be 14. And if the next seven years go as fast as the first seven years, then then I don't know what to think, honestly. And then the the following seven years, she'll be 21. Still single, by the way. (laughs) She'll be 21, and my goodness, and then adulthood just right there. Unbelievable. You know, as the older she gets, and, and I'm, I'm just going to talk about my daughter. And I, and I know there's the other kids too, but they're ugly. So I'm just going to talk about my daughter. So I, 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 I love my daughter. And, and the older she gets, the more independent she becomes. The more independent she becomes. And, 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 and it's, it's exciting to see her become more independent. Now, granted, I know she's only seven years old, but... But the more and more independent she comes, the more she, she develops her personality. This is what I'm beginning to realize. I'm seeing a lot of her mama in her. And that's terrifying. <laughs> no. No, no we're, we are fortunate enough. I mean, God has blessed us. God is good. He's good. God, God has blessed us so much that uh, we, we are in a financial position to where my wife is able to stay home with the kids, and, and I'm very, very thankful for that. And, 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 and I'm, thankful that <clears throat> I'm thankful that my kids have a godly mama. 
I'm thankful that they're around a godly influence. I'm thankful that they, they're around God's word. I'm thankful that they, have, they hear godly music. I'm thankful for that. And, and, and today I know the day where we honor our mothers. And, and motherhood, I, I wouldn't know. <laughs> but I can imagine would have its highs and its lows. For sure. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm, child labor can have its highs and its lows, can it? <laughs> Uh, hey, I, I'm, I'm very, very thankful for godly moms. This morning, as we're, we're looking at this text, we're, we're going to look at a, a, a mother who her daughter was going through a situation and she just felt completely helpless. And, and, and now moms, I'm, I'm pretty sure there, there may have been times that you've maybe seen your, your daughter or your son crying, weeping, mourning, and, and honestly you felt, you, you know what they're going through, but there's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do. All you can do is just, just be there. That's, that's all you can do. And, and there, there's a real sense of helplessness there. And, and you wish you could just kind of take the burden off of them and, and put it on yourself and, because you know that you can handle it better than they can for sure. But the, this particular woman, she, she is going through some uh, difficult time here. And we're, gonna start, we're just going to kind of go through the passage here beginning in verse 21. And, and we see that Jesus in this particular time, he's withdrawing himself away from the crowd's to kind of a place of solitude. Now, look at verse 21. The Bible says, Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. Now, what's Tyre and Sidon? Where's Tyre and Sidon? What's that got to do with anything? Well, uh, Tyre and Sidon, they they were cities that were on the sea coast of the Mediterranean. And this would be very, very close to Gentile territory here. And so what Jesus is doing, he's, he's pulling his, his disciples away because at this point his ministry is beginning to step on the toes of the Jews. You know what I mean by stepping on their toes? Uh, uh, it, it, he's making them uncomfortable is what he's doing. And more particularly, Jesus wasn't concerned about their toes. He was concerned about their hearts. And he was pricking their hearts. And they didn't like the comfort of that. And so to the point where they're almost starting to get hostile here. And so now the disciples and Jesus, they're kind of pulling away for a time of solitude. And, and in the Gospel of Mark, the Bible says that they went into a house and where no man would know it. And, and Tyre and Sidon, that they were uh, getting close to Gentile territory there because the Jews didn't really want to do anything with the Gentiles. And so... We don't necessarily know the precise reasons why Jesus pulled them away. But what we do know is that he pulled them away. He pulled them away. He got away from the multitudes, got away from the crowds. And Jesus' ministry has begun to uh, become very familiar, not just with the, the nation of Israel, not just with Jerusalem, but even the Gentiles are hearing about this Messiah. Even the Gentiles are hearing about him. And as a result of Jesus' uh, I hate to use the word, but I really don't know of another word to use for it. Fame, his popularity. Understand, Jesus wasn't concerned about having popularity. He wasn't concerned about being famous. Jesus' concern was this, fulfilling his Father's will. That's what his concern was. And so we see him, he's pulling away, and, and that the Gentiles are even beginning to receive word about this Jesus of Nazareth. And we notice that a Gentile woman makes, his way to, makes her way to Jesus to intercede on behalf of her daughter. Now look at verse 22. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast. Now, a woman of Canaan. Now, we've got to understand something about this woman's genealogy here. This woman's genealogy is not in her favor. It's not in her favor at all. This woman comes from a genealogy. She comes from a bloodline from the people known as the Phoenicians. And the Phoenicians, if you study the book of Joshua, uh, when Joshua was going into the land with the people that they were supposed to drive out all the Canaanites and the Jebusites and the Perizzites and, and all those different types of ites, the, some of the Phoenicians, they were part of those people. And so... Right off the bat, this woman's bloodline is associated to being enemies with the people of God. So it's not going well for her already. So she she goes there, and, and, and the Bible says 
in the Gospel of Mark, in Mark's account, says that she came and fell at his feet. And you know what she did? When she approached him, she did so in a, an appropriate fashion. She, she, she came to Jesus, and where did she find her place, church? Low. She got low. She was getting in her appropriate place before Jesus. She came to him with reverence. She came to him with respect. She came to him with humility. Hey, church, when we worship God and when we get low before God, whether it's at the altar, whether it's in your bedroom or whether it's in your living room, and you get low before a holy God, you must remember, you must come before him with humility. Because without humility, then that's not proper worship there, church. So when we come before him, we must get low in humility. And that is exactly what this woman is doing. She's coming before him. She's getting low with humility. And now she makes her request to Jesus. Verse 22. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Did you hear what she referred to him as? Thou son of David. Hey, this, has very, this is very significant. You know why this is significant? Because she's, she's a Gentile woman. She's a Gentile lady. And she had known that, that, that the Jewish people, that they believed that, that, that there was going to come a prophesied Messiah. There's going to come a savior one day. And he was going to come through the lineage and the bloodline of King David. And so here is this Gentile woman who doesn't, who has nothing to do with the Jewish people, has nothing to do with, do with the Jewish culture, who doesn't believe like the Jewish people believe. She comes to Jesus and she bows herself. She gets low and she refers to them as thou son of David. Know what she's saying? She says, I know that you are the rightful king to sit on the throne of David. I know that you are the prophesied one. I know that you are the Messiah. And I know that there's nobody else to turn to. And then she says, have mercy on me. Wow. You know what she does? She believes that Jesus is who he says he is. It's exactly what she's done. This woman's request was very, very serious. Her daughter was vexed with the devil. Her little girl. The Bible doesn't say how old she was. Maybe to try to help us with our minds, let's just say she was seven. My daughter's seven. So it kind of gives you kind of an idea of what a seven-year-old might look like. And this, this young girl, she was possessed with a demon. Hey, I've said this before, and I probably won't ever plan on stop saying this. Hey, demon possession is very, very real and should not be taken lightly. It is nothing to be entertained with. It is nothing that we should find fascinating about. Hey, no, no, no. God does not call us to know the enemy. God calls us to know him. He deals with the enemy, church. Yeah. One cannot begin to imagine the helplessness of this mother. I mean, I can't imagine I, seriously, I, I cannot imagine watching the, her little girl being tortured literally from the inside out by demonic forces that are far greater than man. So this woman, she, she humbles herself before the prophesied Messiah. She recognizes him as the king. She recognizes him as being as the savior. She, she's very, very serious in her regards to her daughter being demon-possessed, and she's begging for, for Jesus to have mercy, and, she, and she's begging for her daughter to be free from, quite literally, the, the bondage of Satan. And she's, she's low, she's humble, she's bringing this request before Jesus. And now look at Jesus' response in verse number 15, or excuse me, verse 23. But he answered her not a word. We, we try to teach our kids. If someone speaks to you, you acknowledge it. If someone speaks to you, you say, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, no, sir. At least acknowledge some recognition. I mean, nobody likes to be snubbed, right? Can you imagine coming to Calvary Baptist Church? No, I'm just going to pick Pastor Young because he's not here. But who here can keep a secret, okay? No. <laughs> 
No, uh, I'm using him because th- this, is, this, is, uh, this won't even apply to him. You would think that this is ridiculous. Can you imagine going to Pastor Young and saying, Hello, Pastor, and he looked you dead in the eyeball and not saying anything? That's not like him. We know that that's not like him. But here she is. She's before the prophesied Messiah, the Son of God. She's low. She's in her proper place. She has proper humility. She's getting low, and she's begging for mercy for her daughter's sake. And then the Bible says that he answered her not a word. He didn't say anything. Have you ever had something so heavy on your heart that it was, a, it was as though the God wasn't saying anything? It's quiet. I mean, what you have in your heart is something serious. I'm not trying to downplay what you might be going through. I'm not trying to downplay that, it's not, well, it's not that big of a deal. No, I'm not saying that at all. I mean, you might be seriously going through something pretty traumatic or something pretty that's really heavy on your heart, and you want to hear from God, and it's like, we want to hear from God now. We need to hear from God now. And this woman, her situation was very serious. And, and, and now we, we see what the Bible says that it says, and his disciples came and besought him saying, send her away for she crieth after us. So the, Jesus and his disciples, they, they've gotten away to a place of solitude to try to get away for a time. Remember the thing, and hey, this is a time for us to rest. This is a time for us to kind of regain our strength to go out and serve. And now here's this woman, and she comes before Jesus, and, Jesus, and the disciples say, Lord, just send her away. Just send her away. She, she's interrupting our quiet time. She's interrupting our, our, our place of solitude. J- just send her away already. She's being kind of a nuisance. You ever had one of those days? Amen. Yeah. Verse 24. Jesus, he addresses her and he says, but he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of Israel. Now, church, get this. We understand that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. We know that. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. That is everybody. For God so loved the world. And we believe that wholeheartedly, don't we? For sure we do. But understand, when Jesus came to this earth, his first primary focus of people to minister to was to the children of Israel. It's not, though, it's not as though he had no regard for the Gentiles. That's not what he's saying there. Because the gospel needed to go to the Jew first, and then it would make its way to the Gentile territories, and it did on the day of Pentecost, or after Pentecost. That's, that's what that would happen there. And I, and I love this woman's response after Jesus tells her that he is not uh, sent but unto the lost sheep of Israel. In verse 25, she just says this, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Sometimes that's all we can utter. Sometimes that's all we can say. Now, now I'm speaking to mamas here, so, but men still tune in because this could be kind of a help to you. Hey, moms, I know sometimes you're stressed and I know sometimes you're going through a hard time and the only thing that you can just say is, Lord, help me. Help me with my situation. Help me with my kids. Help me with my day. And the only words that you can utter that your mind can just bring into thought is just, Lord, help me. This woman was desperate. Can you hear it in her voice? I hope you can. Verse 26, but he answered and said, it is not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. <laughs> Jesus says, it's not good to take children's bread and give it to the dogs. You know, it appears that as Jesus is speaking to this woman, he's doing it in a way that we would consider to be rude. I mean, the Jews, they had often referred to Gentiles as dogs. That's what they did. I mean, there was animosity, much animosity between Jew and Gentile. And then in Jesus, he, he says, it's not good for me to take food for, or bread from children and give it to the dogs. You, you know, uh, I mean, uh, in a sense, that's, that's pretty derogative and belittling, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, dogs in the Bible, they were known as being kind of scavengers. That's what they were. I, I mean, 
larger dogs. I mean, we would talk about dogs probably maybe the size of a lab or a German shepherd or, you know, good sized dogs. Uh, th- they would be known as wild dogs and they would run the land and they would scavenge and they would be in packs and types of, and those types of things. But the word dog that Jesus used here in verse 26, uh, the Greek word is kunarion, right? Sounds good to you? Sounds good to me too. Kunarion. A- and kunarion means this, Pup, little dog, lap dog. I have a lap dog. Some of you have called it a lap, a lap rat. But this is the thing. Every time we eat dinner, our little lap dog, she's always right next to us. She's always looking. She's always waiting. She's always licking her chops. That's what she's doing. She's waiting for something to fall. Is what she's doing. But still, nonetheless, Jesus says, it's not meat for me to take the bread and, to give, it to, and give it to dogs. I meant for the lost sheep of Israel. Now, I butchered that verse, but you know what I'm saying. He's still kind of referring to her as a, a dog nonetheless. But notice, she didn't say, how dare you refer to me as a pup? How dare you refer to me as a dog? Come on, ladies. Would you be pretty upset if someone referred to you as a dog? (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And she, she she didn't overreact here. She didn't say, I don't have to stay here and take this. I mean, I came before you. I bowed before you. I even came with humility before you. And you ignored me. And not only that, you said that you're not sent to my people. And not only that, but you're referring to me as a dog. I've had it. I'm going to go somewhere else. She could have. But notice notice what she says in verse 27. And she said, truth, Lord. Wow. She didn't say, how dare you refer to me as a pup. She did not respond in anger or retaliation. She said, truth, Lord. Yet the dogs eat the crumbs which befall from their master's table. You know, this is the thing, church. She knew who he is. She knew he's Messiah. She knew he's the king. She knew he's the savior. And she knew who he is and she knew who she was. She says, I'm a Gentile woman who comes from a bloodline that was at first the enemies of the people of God. I know I have that going against me, but I know that there's nobody else that can help me like you can help me. I know who you are and I know who I am. And, and, but this is the thing, Lord. I know that you're sent to the lost sheep of Israel first. And I know that they get first regard to your mercies and to your blessings. I understand that, but I'm not asking you to bless me like, like you bless them. I'm not asking you to give me the mercies that you're going to give them I'm just asking for the crumbs of your blessings I'm just asking for the crumbs of your mercies I just want this much I'm not asking for all of it you know it's astounding it's so astounding that she knew that this much of his blessings was still more powerful than the devil's Warren Wiersbe said this, he said, it must have rejoiced his heart when she took his very words and used them as a basis for her plea. She accepted her place, she believed his word, and she persisted in her plea. Yeah. Then we look at verse 28, it says, then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Bid it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole that very hour. You know, the best way to summarize what happened is that this, we'll just say seven years old. We don't know how old she is. We'll just say seven-year-old. This seven-year-old girl, because of her mama's persistent faith in Christ, it impacted her greatly didn't it? Yeah. Mark says, the gospel of Mark says that the mother went home and found her daughter laid upon the bed, finally at peace. Can you, can you imagine? You imagine, you're, ladies, you're, you're going home and, and you just poured out your heart to Jesus. 
and you go home and you, you're expecting to see a sight, you're expecting to see turmoil, you're, you're expecting to see something fearful, you're expecting to see something that's, uh, that's horrible to look upon, and you open the door and you see your little girl sleeping on her bed. Wow. You know why? Because a mama was persistent in her faith. You know, when everything appeared to be discouraging for her, her faith was persistent. Her background was, uh, as a Canaanite woman, that was, that was an obstacle in her faith. I mean, the Lord's silence to her plea, no doubt, would have been discouraging, wouldn't it? I mean, the Lord's language that he used would have been discouraging. And, and she understood who she was, she understood who he is, and she understood that he's Messiah. She understood that he was the one that the Jewish prophets had prophesied about. She understood that he had the authority over devils. She understood that he was the rightful king to sit on the throne of David. She understood that Jesus is Lord. And because she uh, was so uh, persistent in her faith, this, we can just say it like this, like the song says, faith was the victory. Faith was the victory for that little girl and for that mama. Hey, faith is the victory for us today, church. It's still the victory. Hey, I, I know who I'm preaching to this morning. Hey, there was a lot of obstacles that, kept, that keeps us from heaven's door. There's a lot of obstacles. I mean, for one thing, your background is an obstacle that keeps you from heaven. Well, how you figure? You're born a sinner. You're born a sinner. Your background is an obstacle. The obstacle of your helplessness is an obstacle. There's nothing that you can do to gain access to God. I mean, if, if, you, if you missed, I think it was Tuesday night with Brother McCracken, how he used the illustration. Maybe I should get to use the illustration. How many of you want to see that again? That would be great. No, no, no. I mean, Brother McCracken, he, he used three large men. He used Brother Joel, Brother Dustin, and Brother Bo, and they made this wall, and they had uh, uh, my dad over here standing over here representing God, and Brother McCracken, he's trying to plow through the wall, trying to gain access to God, but no, no, there's an obstacle called sin. Now, I'm not trying to re-preach Brother Davis McCracken because, to be quite honest with you, I could not do that justice, for, just be honest with you. But the, but the truth of the matter is this, that God made a way for man to get to God. And that man is not a what, it is a who, and it is the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, hey, the, the, probably the most exciting day of your life, ladies and gentlemen, is you understand that you are a sinner, and the Lord Jesus Christ, he's the only way that can get you through the obstacle to gain access to the Father. You remember when you accepted Christ as your Lord and personal Savior? That is the greatest day of your life. I'll go in one step further. That's the greatest day of your eternity. Yeah. There's no greater day than that. Now, there are some great days that you can have in your life. There's a great day of graduating high school. That's a great day. With this guy, I never look back. There's a great day of graduating college. It's a great day. There's a great day when I stood on that platform and said, I do to her, and she said, I do too. And we did. Those are great days. And you, some of you have experienced great days like that as well. Okay, now, now I want to talk to the moms here. Remember the day when God made you a mama? Was that a great day? Maybe it wasn't. <laughs> Was it a great day? I know, ladies. I know you're pretty quiet usually. But now would be a really good time if your kids are sitting next to you to say amen. So, just saying. <laughs> no, 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 no. When you became a mama, God blessed you with life. He blessed you with a life. And understand, as a mama, and dads too, of course, but, I'm, but just it's Mother's Day, okay? So bear with me. As a mom, God has given you a responsibility to have an impact on that little one to, that you brought into the world. To have a spiritual impact on them. Come on. To have a spiritual impact on them. 
And the way that you can have a spiritual impact on that little life that God put inside of you so that you can bring into the world, the way that you can have an impact on that young person's life is this, by your persistence in faith in Christ. That's it. You can have a spiritual impact on them. Yeah. And not just moms, but grandmas as well. Grandmas as well. Hey, little ones need to see grandmas who are persistent in their faith for the Lord Jesus Christ. They need to see that. They need to see that. um, The greatest influence in a young person's life, now, now, I'm not wanting to step on toes here, but I want us to be biblically accurate. The greatest influence in a young person's life should not be a coach. Should not be a teacher. Should not be a choir director or a band director or an instructor. I'll even say the greatest influence in a young person's life shouldn't even be a youth pastor. The greatest influence in a young person's life should be mom and dad. Should be the greatest influences there. And moms, you can have such an impact in your young person's life, but it will require persistence. Look up here. Can I have your attention, please? Can I have your attention? It will require persistence, and it will require consistency in your faith in Jesus. Yeah. So much so that it'd be something that little Susie or little Billy would be able to witness and say, that is real. No, they, no. they need to see mom crack open her Bible more than just Wednesday and Sundays. They, they need to see that it's real. They need to see that, that mom is serious about serving Jesus. Mom is serious about loving God. Mom is serious about that. And, and I guarantee you, those things, though they might not necessarily alter the course of their life, but it will make an impact in their life. And understand this, mom loves Jesus. You know, I remember as a young man, <laughs> probably even younger, I'm not even going to look that way. I'm not going to look that way. And what I'm about to say, I'm not saying it to tickle ears. And I'm not saying it just because she's my mom. And I'm not just saying it because she's here. I'm saying this because it's factually true. And I'm saying this because uh, uh, I'm not going to use the preaching and the platform and and my position to, uh, to elevate people. Okay, I'm not trying to do that. But I am going to say this. There have been times when I was a little boy. I knock on my mama's bedroom door. Just to see what she's doing. She'd be laying in her bed with the lamp on. And the word of God is open on her lap. <laughs> and as a little boy. I'm, I, I didn't, it didn't resonate much. But now as a parent. I understand. Hey, it's important that young people see moms reading their Bible. And it's important that young people see moms having a relationship with Christ and knowing that it is real. And God may have blessed you with a godly mom. God may have blessed you with a mama who is just as faithful as my mama. Now I understand she's not a perfect mom. Now I'll look over there. She's not a perfect mom. I understand that. But this is, what, this is what I noticed as a little boy. She loved Jesus. She loved Jesus. And it had an impact on a little boy, but now as a 32-year-old parent myself, I understand that it's important that my kids see me reading the Word of God. And my kids see me spending time with Jesus. And my kids see me loving Christ. You know why? Because they might not appreciate it now, but when they're older, they might say, hey, you know what? Dad was faithful. Mom was faithful. They love Christ. It's not something that's fake. It's not something that's a facade. No, their relationship with Christ is real. And because it's real for them, I want it to be real for me. 
hey, moms, you can have such, such, such an impact on your girl and such an impact on your son, but it must be real. Your faith must be persistent in the Lord Jesus Christ. Is it real? Is it real? Is it real? Or is church just something we do? You know, God gave you a life to have an impact, to have an eternal impact. Him. I, I, I've said this before, that it was because of family devotions. It's because of family devotions that I've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Praise God for that, for family devotions. Guess whose idea it was to have family devotions? Moms. Moms. Every boy and every girl deserves to have a mama. Come on. Every boy and every girl deserves to have a mama. But every boy and every girl deserves to have a mama that will have a spiritual impact on their lives by their persistency and in their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. How's your faith this morning? Are you persistent in wanting to know him more? Are you persistent in wanting to spend time with him in the word more? Hey, faith goeth by hearing, and hearing by the what? Word of God. So here's the thing. It, 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 this woman, it was her faith. It was her faith that had the impact on her daughter, wasn't it? Hey, if you want to have an impact on your kids or your grandkids or your great grandkids, if you want to have an impact, then it's going to require you to have faith. And the more, the more you're in the Word of God, the more Bible preaching that you hear and the more Bible teaching that you hear and the more you open the Word of God, whether it's in your bedroom or in the coffee table or in, your, or in your living room, the more and more you're in the Word of God, the more and more your faith will grow. And the more and more your faith grows, the greater impact you can have on the next generation. Or is your relationship with Christ Sunday and Wednesdays? You can have a real impact, a genuine impact. I know it's Mother's Day. Mothers, I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for godly moms. I'm thankful for, but understand, your role is so important. So important. And you can be the godly mom, and you can be the godly, godly grandma, or you can, you can be the godly great-grandma if the Lord allows you. And you can have an impact, but it will be based on your persistent faith in Christ. You know, let's pray. Father, Lord, I thank you for this day. Lord, I want to thank you for Lord, thank you for the, the account that we just read about. Lord, I want to thank you for the account, Lord, of 